Retro Hangover is supported via Patreon by listeners like you. We would especially like to thank patrons Lyle McCarns, Ashton Ruby, Randall Quiggle, Tony G, Katie Quigg, Paul Romalo, Jared Kernop, Raging Demon, Masked Llama, Ozzy Garcia, Keith Gasper, and Diskimera. Your continued engagement and generous donations are deeply appreciated. Open your ears and crack some beers. You are listening to episode 97 of Retro Hangover. Hello, retro and classic gamers. Welcome to the podcast where we are excitedly exhuming eloquent and excellent aesthetics from the ether. This is episode 97 of Retro Hangover. I am your co-host, Chris Copleen, with special guest, Cade Call, and as always, your host, Shane. Blue and red, Dick Dragon! <laughs> this never gets old it never it, it never gets it. old for me no, like, just, <laughs> it's funnier when you're on the show because <laughs> it like he fraps out like yeah. the mic and so you he just, just hear silence he just bezos then, is out to space every time we do this and then you just hear these little glitches of him still screaming coming in and out and it's just like silent forever and you just know that he's been screaming this whole time. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have fun with it. G- I given, love going into space with billionaires. Yeah, no, it's great. It's, I mean, it's it's apropos given that it was also on a cock spaced ship. So, you know, it's, it's <laughs> worked out pretty well. I feel like I don't know whether I would want to be the blue or the red dragon given today's topic. I think you should be the green one. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, I should go with green. As long as you have the white page, you need the white page. That's a little racy. Mm. Well, you know, you know how I do. Uh, um, that's awkward. Hey, so Kate, <laughs> welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing good. I am very excited to speak in regards to some aspects of today's games. And I think for once... We'll have a conversation where you and I just don't disagree the entire time. Wow. I think so. That that will be interesting, especially because this time you're not jumping up and down and cursing about Dragon Quest. So we <laughs> don't have that going on. I do appreciate that. So I guess, uh, hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Retro Hangover. We are talking about the PC classic, Mist. And that will be our topic for today. It is great to have Kate on, as we just said. We'll give him more opportunity to talk about what he's been up to lately and what's going on in his world. But before we do that, Shane. Yes. What have you been up to, dude? How have you been doing? Uh, Working. That's that's what I've been doing. I've been doing the adult <laughs> thing, I guess. Um, I mean, comparatively, not that it's terrible, I suppose. You know, we're working from home is it's pretty nice. Not going to lie. You know, I've got my nice little hermit cave over here um, that I spend the majority of my time in. And that's it's not bad. It's not bad. Um, The fridge is not that far away. So, you know, and I I think we I I think I mentioned it. I don't know. You you might need to you might need to keep me honest on this, Chris, because I don't remember. Have I have I mentioned the housing situation on the show yet? Is that is that official? Hi. Hi. Did you say hi? I said hi. (laughs) Okay. Oh, oh, you right. say Japanese high. I uh, get it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, no, I'm a stoner high, but yeah, then yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Well, so, high. so yeah, so that, that's <laughs> moving along nicely. We've uh, had our initial meetings with the construction project manager, kind of overview of what they're doing and a notional timeline, which I'm not super thrilled with because now it's looking like we're not going to be able to move until about 
mid to late December. He's shooting for prior to Christmas, which is nice. Um, but with, you know, material shortages and all that other stuff, it's kind of pushing things out a little bit further than perhaps we'd hoped, but, um, but you know, is what it is. So we'll, we'll kind of take it as it comes. Um, but overall pretty, pretty good. We're, we're going to start prepping, you know, this place to, to make the big move. But uh, as far as the Vigi games, um, not a lot's changed, uh, since last time we recorded, honestly, uh, a lot of my time is just being spent playing the the games that we happen to be talking about here on the show. Uh, either me playing through them for the first time or just going back and re-experiencing things. Because a lot of these I haven't fired up since, you know, since I was but a wee lad. So that's been taking up the majority of my my gaming time. But I don't know. What, what about you? What, what have you been up to? I've finally organized a lot of the things going on in my life in terms of uh, exactly when I'm going to be going to all these schools for the Navy. So that's some peace of mind because it was kind of up in the air prior to this week. And I think I think that's settling in. So, again, this is why we're not talking about a lot of games is because I'm going to be gone for two months, a little over two months. So we're trying to preload as much as I can while I'm going to be in a situation where I don't have Internet, which is going to be fun. Uh, But that's that's exciting. Also, my room is a mess because I just got a bookshelf to put all the games that I have stored on top of my closet because there's a little awning above my closet. Mm. And I've been posting that in our discord, showing everyone my Wii U collection, which I'm sure everyone is happy to see, especially Cade, because (laughs) he's like working on this like cool design, I think, for the merch store. And I'll probably get that. (laughs) I'm looking forward to that. Cade made a really sick one and it was Ah, so good. But in terms of uh, video games, as as you said, I've been playing uh, some some Tokyo Mirage sessions, like I said on the last episode. Again, like it hasn't been that long since we last recorded. So a lot of the same carryover. But another game came out since then, or at least I've been playing it more. And it was called uh, Dreamscaper. What games come out? I know, right? It's weird. Unheard of. But (laughs) they, they make new games from time to time. I don't believe it. I know, especially on this show, Uh, but it's called Dreamscaper and I backed it, uh, I guess. I think it's two or three years ago. I know that the development team started working on it three years ago and it's a roguelike and it the version 1.0 came out, I think, last week. And I've been playing the absolute crap out of that, getting frustrated because it is hard because it is a roguelike and uh, I haven't been able to stop playing it, even to the detriment of Tokyo Mirage Sessions, which I could be done with by now. But uh, I've just been hooked on this one game. It's like crack for me. And I've been streaming it in our Discord. So if you want to see me play games from time to time, you know, hop in the Discord and you can go there. You can find that on Linktree, which will be at the end of the episode. So I look forward to seeing you there. But yeah, it's it's been interesting gaming. I also played the game du jour, so to speak. And uh, I played that on the Saturn for today of all systems. I didn't have to play it. Well, I probably did. It was the most convenient one for me. But uh, yeah, so more time on the Saturn is always a good time. Nice. That leads us to Cade. Cade, what have you been up to, man? You were last on here on Dragon Quest. I'm sure you got a lot to talk about. So what's going on in your world, dude? Oh, man. Well, mainly I am launching a bunch of kind of deeper content for a YouTube channel. I'm basically just waiting on some logo animations and a new logo, but I have the content ready. In which uh, my first project was I played through all of Final Fantasy VIII with basically every badass mod available. There's a mod that takes all the pre-ordered backgrounds, extracts them, runs them through various AI upscaling like NVIDIA's Earthscan, uh, Topaz AI, etc. And they manually retouch them up for like some of the artifacts, put them back into the game. This is the uh, PC remastered version. So I, I got went down the rabbit hole of doing all the mods. Played through the whole game, got all the bosses, got all the summons, got all the spells, and then I'm uh, running all that footage through an AI interpolation, which gives you an idea of what the game would look like if it could run at 60 frames per second, and it's actually pretty accurate, just because there's I, there's just like a hole for some of like really niche emulation content on YouTube, and I'm mm-hmm. into that, so I just thought I kind of re- I researched it. I was just looking at like the, looking at numbers, running some tools, like what kind of content could I make that would work with making videos help me promote the podcast and also be good like deep content for youtube to build 
And that's what I ended up on. And now I am playing through Legend of the Dragoon, doing mm. the same thing. And uh, that's been really fun. And I've already released like a couple short videos with some of that footage and they've done really, really well. The game, I knew it had a cult following. I knew I liked it and it came up occasionally, but uh, I've been surprised at uh, the response to that video. Like very passionate fan base is still, still around. In fact, a lot of people got angry at me because I, I think I said something along the lines like a, a, there's a forgotten PS1 game that has really cool transformations. So many comments <laughs> of like, bitch, I didn't forget. Who the, like people like, who the fuck forgot? We've been fucking talking like people getting so yeah. angry. I think about Breath this game Fire every Street. day. <laughs> yeah. Do they, they, do they say bloody roar? <laughs> or they'll, they'll say like burning rush volcano. Just like people uh. would st- it's a very passionate fan base. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've been surprised. I've been also surprised that just like, <sighs> you don't have to get that many views to start running into angry people on the internet. I did a video where I used that when I was first experimenting with this uh, interpolation software. I was like, I ran some Street Fighter 3 sprites and posted them, the results. And uh, that blew up. But for people were like, lots of people were very angry. <laughs> about like it's ruining animation computers uh this is no, more frames isn't equal better fuck this my eyes hurt i can never unsee this one guy met, dm'd me and was like never touch street fighter 3 sprites again <laughs> and, holy shit <laughs> I, I wrote back uh what did i write back i was like you should unfollow me because i've been touching them all over and uh <laughs> and he was like what did he, i think he said like you're making me real fucking angry guy or something. And I didn't respond, but I was just, it was like, I'm surprised at the things. This is what our society has gotten to. People get angry over sprites being run through a program and the results posted on the internet. It's, it's a wild world out there. But anyway, it's lots of I, PS1 look, gaming. It, huh. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, <laughs> even if you're angry, how, how can you be so angry that you're going to contact some Let's just say like a relative rando on the internet. Definitely. And just, 100% and, rando. <laughs> and put out your <laughs> anger and just be like, how dare you? How dare you put this on the internet? Like, dude, rule 34 is a thing. So I don't know if you know this, but there's a lot of things on the internet. You, you would probably make you angry. If <laughs> Street Fighter 3 through an animation program is going to boil your blood. So how about you just chill the fuck out? Yeah, I, I don't like, understand the what? rationale behind that either. It's like, what what's your end game here, right? Like, what are you hoping to achieve? By doing People that. felt they felt threatened, almost like human animation is. A lot of comments were like, "Human am- animation will always be better," and like it's not better. People feel threatened by the idea of like the culture pushing for more FPS. Lots of like more FPS does not equal better sentiment. But like, no how does that affect them personally? Like, I know, are they I, are they, they a they sprite artist? Like, that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, like they think the AIs are coming to take their job. I I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like I mean, that's everybody that is everybody it's that's, uh, if that's that the is case true. it is everybody and yeah i was just really surprised and also really surprised with legend of dragoon people were offended that i implied the game was forgotten but i uh i mind fucked them i would always respond i responded a few times <laughs> to those comments so people could see it and i was like it's not forgotten to us the real fans but the masses for, <laughs> the, the masses are forgetting so we gotta we gotta remind them and like come on my team like and then most, most of the responses to that rhetoric were positive, but I was still like, I'm surprised, dude. If I, if I get, if I have a video that does well, I never, or people get really angry about the kind of pull a Chris, they get really angry. Like if you just misspeak or say pull something Chris. weird, <laughs> well, thank you. They'll just like, they're just, there's just people out that are waiting to pick apart every little mistake. And, um, I wasn't, of course I do. Yeah. And I just, I have to get used to that. So that's been, um, it's been a learning experience to be like, it's okay. Oh, They're yeah. just a person somewhere At out there. At least if you're reacting positively to it, because when I, when I, when I do that to you and when I say you, I mean you specifically, and there's some <laughs> others, but you specifically, because you make it fun. Yeah. It's because I know your reaction is going to be over the top. So it's like, I'm going to, you, you said something like, well, actually, Cade, this is what really happened. And you don't know what you're talking about. And you're like, you fucker. And I'm like, yes, got him. 
and <laughs> it's it's so great. But um, you're right. I mean, people shouldn't be angry that Legend of Dragoon was forgotten. It was forgotten. It's just that's that's facts. That's just how it is. No yep. one gives a shit about Legend of Dragoon in the bigger picture. I know we have friends of the show like um, Arnie from the Region Free Gamers. He loves that game. I'm sure there's plenty of other people who do. And I mean, obviously you you like it, but that's that's hilarious, man. I love how you trolled back. I mean, like, yeah, the real fans haven't forgotten it. We have to remind them. <laughs> well, and it's funny, yes! too, right? Because like your content doesn't even necessarily have to be popular for this shit to happen. I mean, hell, we, we right. were just talking about this recently where, you know, we, we upload video versions of all of our episodes um, just to have it out there. You know, they don't get a ton of views, but that's OK. And our our Sim, uh, Sim City, that's what it was. Our Sim City episode. Right. Maybe has like 10 views or something on YouTube. And yet somehow we still got like this <laughs> irate commenter on there who was just because we made a crack about Jared during that whole like debacle. Pro Jared. Pro Jared. Not yeah. Subway Jared. Yeah, oh, I mean, what? yeah, but okay. uh, yeah, I made a crack about that. And this guy just like was so like offended. He's like, how dare you make fun of Jared during this time and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Is he do, is he family? Do you know him? Is he your personal close friend? Like, why are you so angry about this right now? Mr. Random person on YouTube who found this video, <laughs> <laughs> who found, yeah, another random video and somehow it's almost like just space debris colliding in chaos. There's just enough debris out there, enough anger. There's enough angry people out there that they'll find you. <laughs> they'll find. I mean, you. at this point, honestly, I'm just hoping that he comes back and he's just like, you know what? I'm going to give those retro hangover guys another chance. And this is the episode that he looks up. <laughs> and he's like, those yeah. motherfuckers. Well, well, last episode, we we gave him some ammunition, too. I'm looking forward to that. That's true. That's true. Wait, has he commented on multiple videos? No, no. it was just the one. He oh, just, just was one. like okay. super pissed about pro Jared and then fucking ghosted. Okay, dude. Like you're entitled to your opinion, man. Yeah. I, what, oh. what can I say? The internet is, I don't want to derail the The internet is a wild place. We'll just say that <laughs> it's wild out there. I think, I think we've already derailed it. <laughs> I think you're okay. Well, yeah, I, mean, I should Let's say, get it back. I don't want to derail it more. I apologize. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I, I suppose getting back on track, which also is going to be uh, much more relevant and probably appreciated as a much better segue once we start talking more about this game a little bit later. Uh, we are, in fact, talking about Mist today, the surreal adventure on your personal computing machine. And uh, to give us a brief history of Mist, Chris is going to go ahead and take it away. Some games just find themselves at the right place at the right time. They aren't necessarily presenting anything new or revolutionary, or really providing an experience that is universally considered to be among the best of its peers. They just find a massive audience that is willing to take a chance on the hot new item or what people consider to be cool. Myst could arguably be considered one of these games. In 1990, two brothers, Rand and Robin Miller, had become bored of making point-and-click adventures for children. Unsatisfied with the trajectory of their previous efforts, they decided they wanted to make a game that was deliberately targeted at adults. One that would feature a non-linear story that forced players to make decisions based on ethical considerations. They also wanted to have a game with graphics that were significantly superior to their previous works. At first, the Millers approached a publishing juggernaut, even at the time, Activision, with the working title of The Grey Summons. Activision summarily rejected their proposal, stating that the Millers should stick to games targeted towards children. As hopes grew dim, an unlikely savior arrived and offered to support their idea of a more adult-oriented experience. Japanese developer and publisher, Sunsoft. In 1991, with the financial backing of Sunsoft, the Millers would officially begin working on their new project under the name Cyan Inc. Cyan would take inspiration from sources such as the game Zork, Star Wars lore, the Chronicles of Narnia, and the works of Jules Verne. 
The inspiration from Verne was so present that the name of the game itself was lifted directly from one of his novels, which also directly inspired the setting, The Mysterious Island. To ensure final funding from Sunsoft, which was not particularly interested in the PC market, the Millers had to draft a seven-page proposal, which mostly consisted of basic game ideas and maps. The final approval from Sunsoft would come when it was asked if Myst would be better than another upcoming CD adventure game, The Seventh Guest, to which they were assured it would be. On September 24th, 1993, Myst would see release for Apple Macintosh home computers under publisher Broderbund. Within six months of release, the game would go on to sell 200,000 copies, a smash hit for a Mac exclusive, causing Broderbund to immediately begin porting a copy to Windows. The Windows version would see release just a year later and would prove to be even more successful, going on to sell 1 million units in the first year. Sales wouldn't slow down either, with both 1995 and 96 seeing almost a million copies sold each year. By 2000, Myst had sold almost 6.5 million units worldwide, and was the best-selling PC game of all time until 2002 when it was unseated by The Sims, but not before garnering the distinction of being the top-selling PC game for 52 months straight. Critics would also welcome the PC releases warmly, pointing to great graphics and a straightforward adventure. Still, other reviewers had heavy criticisms pointing to its static and boring screens, obtuse trial and error puzzles, and incredible difficulty curve. Many of these harsher critiques would carry over to Miss console ports, of which there were many to include the PlayStation, Saturn, 3DO, and, oddly enough, the Jaguar CD. While the console versions may have virtually been identical to the PC port, many console gamers shrugged it off, pointing to it being a far better fit for the PC market, where many of them didn't like it anyway. Regardless of how Myst may be viewed by today's standards, there's no denying how iconic the title has become in the overall pantheon of gaming. The game itself would go on to become a franchise, spawning four mainline sequels and several spin-offs, while making several appearances in mainstream culture. It is seen as a precursor to the walking simulators that are prevalent in modern times, with a graphical presentation that would be duplicated for much of that generation. Sometimes, it just pays to be the right game at the right time. And that is your brief history of Mist. All right, and thank you very much for that brief history, Chris. Again, I, I've told you guys every time I come on, your brief history is like one of my favorite parts. Do you, how mm. do you guys research and write this? Because I could listen to a bunch of these strung together like a super edit. If you just did like all the brief histories of, you could just sit and learn like little tidbits. It's almost like, there's a term I've been thinking of called infotainment, like small bits of information presented in an entertaining way about something you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Anyway. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because I've thought about that before of just um, just taking the brief history segments out of these episodes and just making those available as like little short info tidbit things. Yeah, I think it would 100% work because like every time you guys do it, there's at least like... I don't know, two to three things. And I'm like, really? What? I knew Mist was popular, but 52 weeks straight, 6.5 million units. Months. Mm -hmm. 52 months, months straight. Yes. Second to what was number one until The Sims. I had no idea it was that popular. I had no idea. And like two years after The Sims released, it wasn't, it didn't even, like wasn't immediately overtaken. It took The Sims two years on the market, which was just an explosive game mm -hmm. for its time. And it still took two years for the sims to overcome mist so yeah it was no slouch absolutely no, not definitely yeah i mean today yeah six and a half is nothing yeah it's not today it's not huge but i was watching one of the developer news one that shane and i i think obviously watched the same one and there's a line where he said he was talking about the gaming industry and how big studios pushed out any developers and now with digital releasing the small two-man teams are coming back and he said something along the lines of like Luckily, we didn't have to deal with any of that because we had the profits from Mist. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, yeah, you could do a lot with that money. Mist, I'm like, how much money did Mist make him? I remember thinking like, <laughs> he's been able to fund, he, how old is this, this? This game is how old? And he's been making games this whole time and just funding all his own projects with Mist. How much, and then now you're, you guys doing like, oh, yeah, he made a lot of money for Mist. <laughs> That makes more sense. Yeah, that's that's what I gotta get. I gotta get that missed money. That's what I'm looking yeah. for. <laughs> missed money. Yeah, that makes sense. Was, yeah, was, I had no idea. And then also Jaguar CD is hilarious. And even 3DO. 3DO and Jaguar CD. Like, I didn't know there was missed ports. 3, 3DO is impressive. Another system that, that kind of surprised me that it came out for was the CDI and doing the research for it. I think CDI is a good fit too. If you look back and you look at the history, the CDI is a really good fit. But what I found most interesting, because like I said, you know, before the brief history, is I played this game on the Sega Saturn. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that struck me was in the intro that this game was published by Sunsoft, also a claim, which is also weird because it's not total shit. And we'll get into that later. <laughs> but Sunsoft published it. I was like, why the fuck is Sunsoft publishing this game? Sunsoft does like really weird, like esoteric, but great games for the most part when they develop them or they they publish and, and, and their publishing history is quite spotty but like sunsoft's a very japanese company for the most part and i was like why is sunsoft involved in this so i started doing the research like oh shit like if it wasn't for sunsoft this game probably wouldn't even exist which it just blew my mind away when i found that out it's like that that that's incredible i have still yet to figure out how broderbund ended up jumping in there uh, I guess it was just because Sunsoft didn't know how to publish on, on the PC market. I couldn't find that information. I'd probably write out there. I just couldn't find it. But that's that was interesting. Like just how involved Sunsoft was with Mist. That I never would yeah. have guessed that. Well, and, and honestly, it's kind of it's maybe a little bit of an addendum, I suppose, um, to the brief history. But in the <laughs> in the interview that I'm pretty sure both Cade and I watched, it was mentioned that it seemed as though Sunsoft actually approached the brothers Them. about yes. this based on uh, their previous works that they had done. And Sunsoft liked it so much that they came to them and was like, hey, would you guys be interested in doing something like what you've done before, but for a more adult oriented yes. audience? Yes. And both the brothers were like, hell yeah, like, let's let's fucking do it. So, so it's almost like complete happenstance and, and serendipity. It's just like. We just got turned down by Activision for trying to make an adult game. And Sunsoft's like, hey, do you guys making do you mind making an adult game for us? Yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> the way it seemed like sort of reading in between the lines of that same interview, because he holds up or they show a picture of the Sega Saturn uh, version of the game. And it seemed like they wanted something for the Saturn. And it impl I took away from that that they originally wanted to make it for the Saturn and then they hired that company you mentioned that starts with the B, I forget what it is. Broderbund. Broderbunds that they probably brought them on to help with the PC distribution. That's kind of what I put together, but did they make it originally for the Saturn? That's what I was wondering. Was this originally No, no that's the thing is like they were primarily a Mac development team. And so like they were developing all of this on Macintosh and their primary platform where it was Macintosh. Okay. Yeah, they were doing those uh, like black and white kids games. That it was actually pretty cool. <laughs> that whole we'll get into more about that interview and what they talk about in the development. But yeah, that whole the hyper card thing is like super interesting to me. But yes, we'll we'll get to that in a little bit. But speaking of platforms and and stuff like that, I suppose that kind of segues a little bit into some of our personal experiences of how we kind of got into Mist. So you know what, Be being the guest and all, Cade, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about your history with, with this game? Well, I'll tell you, I had one friend, we probably all had a friend whose dad was a programmer. <laughs> uh-huh. That you could get access, yeah. We all had that friend, usually. If you're into video games, you'd find your way to find someone whose dad has got some cool shit, because that gives you premium access. And so this friend, ha he had like six, com they had this computer room, like not his dad's office, but just like his man cave, which had like six or seven computers. We could all hang out and play Heroes of Might and Magic or whatever. Yeah, nice. That's where I saw Mist, and um, I didn't even know it was on the Saturn until later. And even if I was aware of it, I'd never had a Saturn, so this would have been the only way I could have accessed the game. And what year did Mist come out? I'm already forgetting. Ninety three. 
Oh, wow. I'm pretty sure this would have been, it's my earliest memory, and it might also literally be my first exposure to pre-rendered like assets. Mm -hmm. But I remember the graphics at the time, like I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. It didn't matter to me that you were just clicking pictures and it didn't move. I had played some other games in like the Max Cool Lab where it was a similar thing, like a haunted house game where you just clicked arrows and it was just screens. Yeah. But this was like, it looked at the time to me, this looked real. There's like lighting and it looks like real materials and real surfaces. I think I figured out like maybe one or two puzzles. It didn't matter that I never really made it anywhere in the game because <laughs> it really felt like I was pun intended, like taken away to this mystical island. And I felt like, and I would just wander around and look at things. And it really, it was like trying to figure out what was going on and the sense of this feels mysterious. There's secrets here. I want to find out the secrets. And even though I never really figured much out as a kid when I first played it, it didn't matter because the experience, and I don't know if it was like Chris was saying, or you guys were saying it in the uh, brief history, maybe the reason why it was the right game at the right time is like people like me were primed. They hadn't been done yet. And so that novelty, like what is like, like what would be the word? I'm having a hard time thinking of the word. Like a, whatever's going on with the one hit wonder, mm -hmm. that, was the, that, that was there and they just maybe that's all, that's all it was. It was just maybe the visuals. That's what gave it that initial rocket fuel. And the fact that the game itself, the gameplay, I should say, wasn't really great. It didn't, at least as a kid, didn't matter. It didn't matter that the game was just clicking around. Right. Because it was, it was I was there. Yeah. Like, I understand what you're kind of saying. And in terms of the appeal, you know, what, what that could have been is I think like you had games that were out at this time because CD games, if, if you were in the, the console market and a lot of people at this time were not using their personal computers for gaming for the most part, because personal computers really hadn't taken off in 93, like every household anyway, you True. had to have a little bit of, of money to not only have a personal computer, but have a personal computer capable of gaming with the CD-ROM drive in 1993 or 94 for if you had a, you know, like a, a Windows machine, that was pretty significant. So I think like the appeal of it is it's sophisticated. It I mean, it feels sophisticated and it looks sophisticated. Yes. It has an, an atmosphere to it. It has a different feel to it than other point and click adventures of the era. And it just it just feels more mature. And we'll get more into the gameplay that I, I, I want to talk more about that. But I could definitely see it because like at home on the home market with the TurboGrafx CD and the Sega CD, you had Sherlock Holmes, which had a lot of similar play elements. You know, you, you click on things, you, you move, you see a video, you go somewhere else. Uh, you had adventure games that weren't point and click like. The uh, Secret of Monkey Island, uh, King's Quest, those kind of things, you know, that you had had those for quite some time. But Myst was doing something different. And again, like it wasn't doing something that much different than the seventh guest, but it did something more. And I, I think that was more the, the way it presented itself, which I think was a little bit more sophisticated than those other games. Yeah, I think you're right. It was it's art, like it's presentation and style. Yeah, I think that might have been the secret sauce. So how about you, Shane? How, what was your first experience with it? Yeah, mine was actually pretty similar to to Cade's. And I would imagine probably similar to a lot of people if you were around this age group at, at the time that this was, you know, at its peak popularity. Anyway, I had a, a friend at school who I used to hang out with quite a bit. He he lived not too far away from the school that we went to, actually. So it was super easy to just like walk over to his place and hang out after school a lot of days. And I would do that. And uh, his family had a PC, you know, back when we had not only a family PC, but also like an entire room dedicated to just that computer. <laughs> so we would go over there and I'd hang out and he would always have these games that like I never had because my family didn't actually get a computer till a few years later after this. And so this was like a big deal to me. And amongst the games that we played over there, um, this was one of them. And this was definitely one of the ones that left the biggest impression on me because of the the atmosphere that it kind of engenders and that very you know sort of mysterious kind of almost otherworldly um vibe that it's got going on and especially for someone in you know in that age bracket at that time 
you're still pretty impressionable, you know? So there, there might be a little bit of magic left in the world for you. You're not quite a cynical adult like the rest of us now quite yet. Mm -hmm. I think that is, you know, you're talking about right place, right time in the brief history. And I honestly think for, for us who were of that age, when this game came out, especially it was the right time because it leaves this, this mark on your psyche almost as you grow up where you look back on this game and you remember it being this like just strange experience that was often completely impenetrable, which is infuriating in its own right. And we'll get into that in a little bit, but at the same time, it leaves this very indelible mark of just like, it was, it was unlike any other experience, even the other adventure games that you mentioned just because of how it presented itself. And I think also a big part of that probably is that first person perspective, which again, we'll probably expound upon in a little bit, but being the person stepping into the shoes of the person exploring the world, rather than seeing it from, you know, the, the outside from a third person perspective, like a lot of the other games would tend to do, I think also made a huge difference. What about you, Chris? You kind of started to touch on that, but what was your experiences with this thing? So hi, everyone. I am the guy whose dad was a programmer. Mm. So I'm I'm that kid that you're that friend. Yes, I'm that friend that had missed when it came out on the Mac, I think, in 1993. And I, of course, did not ask to play Mist. I don't remember being excited about Mist. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't ask for this. (laughs) no. Because I, I don't even remember being excited about Mist. It was like we all remember as kids um, when you know, especially when you're really young, that when your parents are excited about something, you naturally become at least somewhat a little bit excited about something, especially sure. when it those interests overlap. So I think my dad just came home one day and he was he had missed and it was on a CD. And I can't remember specifically because I remember it was for one of the computers. So uh, there used to be these drives that you would put the CDs into like these little uh, holders before you put them into the computer. I don't do either of you know what the fuck I'm talking about. I have nope. <laughs> Drawn a blank. OK, I thought you were just being like a smarmy asshole talking about a disk drive. But are you talking about something no. specific? It's almost like you put it in a cartridge and then you put the cartridge in the slot in the computer. Yeah, you would put the CD and you put the CD in like this cartridge and then you put the cartridge into the CD reader. Uh, I could see I that. I've mean, never seen that before. That would make sense yeah, as an early CD-ROM drive. Yeah, yeah, it's it's wild, and that's how I remember playing early CD games. But I think at this point, like I, for some reason, I had a Mac in my in my own bedroom. Don't don't start that. I mean, we already have three <laughs> consoles for Christmas. I don't want to hear anything else. But um, I had a Mac. He's like, yeah, play this game. Play this game. I'm like, oh, okay. So I I played the game, and it always confused me. Just because, you know, I'm, I'm a console video game player. And if I'm not playing games like Myst, not these games I'm about to mention probably came out a little bit afterwards. I'm playing like games like the Yukon Trail and the Oregon Trail from, I think, Maxis is who made them. Mm-hmm. And those were the games I was really interested in. If I'm playing a game like Myst, I'm thinking, where's the bad guys? Um, there's something's going to attack me. So the environment that Myst presented and is very you know, kind of cryptic in what it's supposed to do, especially for an eight year old. I mean, it was targeted for adults. I was even surprised. First of all, I was even able to figure out some of the puzzles. I don't remember how I figured it out because there was no Internet. I don't know. My dad told me or I just donked around with the controls forever. It wasn't necessarily a game for me. It wasn't designed towards me. I lost interest quickly. I booted up because it was cool to look at. I mean, especially on a Mac, the graphical capabilities of Macs back in the early 90s far exceeded PCs. I don't care what you say. Uh, Because they were using Macs to develop computers. So like everything on it was gorgeous. It was far exceeding anything I had inside, you know, my video game console experience. I mean, it was even better than what you would get on any CD based platform with full mission video, which I didn't have in 93. So, yeah, it was it was really cool to look at and play around with. But it just didn't grab my attention for very long because of the frustration I would have and not figuring out exactly what I was supposed to do with this game. Yeah, that was that was my experience with it. So I, I tried it out a lot when it first came out, but I, it didn't take me long to really get over it. Well, I think that is probably going to be a common thread through the rest of this discussion. If I had to go out <laughs> on a limb, probably. Yeah. And speaking of uh, threads like plot threads, we could talk a little nice. bit about the uh, the writing that went into this game. So, Cade, what do you got to say about about the, the plot and writing of Mist? 
Well, I got I to gotta separate. So there's missed the game singular and missed the series. Ah, yes. I think missed the game is pretty solid. It was kind of retconned a little bit to fit better into the total lore with the real missed masterpiece edition. So what I found out the game, that's the version I played by the way, which we'll get into uh, all that. The PC mm -hmm. like kind of reworked. Anyway, what I learned on the forums is that is considered more canon than the original release of Mist. Interesting. I didn't dive into exactly like what things had changed, but in general, it's considered by the the community to be more canon than the original version. I would say that, and that's what I played, and I honestly played it for about like an hour and a half, and then just watched the rest because the gameplay just sucks. I don't want. I don't like walking <laughs> simulators, and but I was very interested in the writing and the lore and i learned enough from playing that first little bit to like oh i would kind of remember this oh i remember this name i remember that name i remember the brothers and like okay the island and so i started going down the rabbit hole and i ended up ironically i didn't want to spend a ton of time playing the walking simulator i skimmed through some playthroughs that were only like an hour and a half long but i probably watched four and a half five hours of mist lore <laughs> So I spent more time than I would have if I just played the game, ironically. I didn't save any time. I actually spent more time. But that's my preface. The series, as the series as a whole and the idea, I think, is awesome. The original Myst experience, they hadn't pre-built the entire meta plot out. So it's, it's not as good by itself. Mm -hmm. But the, the remastered version, the Masterpiece Edition, is pretty good in terms of writing and plot and they foreshadow things better and they explain things better. They have like, they'd move some things around to make puzzles easier hints. I know there's some general quality of life improvements on it. So I would say it's really, really good. I don't know how deep you want to get into like the actual plot and lore of the whole world. But if you want to open that can of worms, I can definitely answer some of the questions that Chris has in his notes for this section at the very least. Well, I don't know. Now, now I'm, yeah. now I'm scared. I don't know if I want to open that can of worms with somebody who just spent like five hours watching lore videos, but, yeah. <laughs> but we could, we could do that. I don't know. So I guess we should say just because for, you know, general sake, uh, spoilers for mist. <laughs> yeah. There. So there, we just said spoilers. There you go. Yes. Not our fault anymore. <sighs> so in terms of the plot though, I guess I'll go next year. And I, I did like the fact that it was very cryptic. I, I, there is a part of it that I liked about that aspect of this game it is the eeriness that it kind of provides the the essence of wonder that kind of perpetuates and, and pushes you to go through the game because you don't know what the fuck's going on for the most part. I mean, it doesn't really do a good job of explaining anything. And I'm sure Kate will be like, well, in the masterpiece version. OK, great. But in this version, in the original version, it doesn't really tell you shit. It doesn't do anything. You just come on this island and it's just like, OK, click and move around. And then once you start to explore, you start to get bits and pieces of things. And one of the things I like, and this is something I like about games of this style or really any style, is that a lot of the exposition and background about what you're seeing and what's going on has to be experienced through gameplay. And one of the one of the things that seems kind of boring at first, and it's 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 a good and a bad thing, is at the very beginning of the game when you go to the books and it tells you the history of all the land and where the father you know, how he built up all these these lands with the people who live there. And then you go to these places. And if you remember what was written down, you're just like, oh, wow. Like, what the fuck happened here? And I thought that was really cool. It provided a lot of backstory and a lot of expositions for an environment that if you had just gone there without knowing that, like, it, it would take so much away from. But you have to do it. And even when it comes to the brothers and their, their, dis, their uh, differences and their general dispositions, seeing their rooms in each one of the ages and then listening to them talk when you bring the pages back to their books, especially the first time you open them, you're like, what what's going on? And every single time you bring it back, you learn more and more about these 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 characters and you have you start to form an opinion of them like that was all really cool. Now, I don't like the fact that it never really explains who the fuck you are, how you got there, why you're there, what you're doing. And it alludes to the the father's wife, Catherine, which I thought I was the entire time. Turns out, no, you're not. Uh, you're just some rando who showed up on an island and you don't know why. Now, Kate, I'm sure you can explain why and I'm sure you will. But I in will. this game, so we'll <laughs> as an isolated moment, it does nothing to that effect. 
whatsoever. It just leaves you hanging even after you complete it. You just got done. You just talked to the dude and no one even bothers to wonder or ask. The, I mean, maybe they did ask the question how you ended up there, but that's never explained like at all, which I think is it's kind of a letdown. So Shane, what's your thoughts? Well, actually, before I get into my thoughts, I'm curious if Cade has a, a counterpoint on sure the whole who you are thing. Yeah. So the Mist series as a whole, uh, that's all like very explained before. Like there's some less I could say it is the creators of the the brothers intended the, what they call you the, who are playing. They call him the stranger to be to have no background of who you are because they want it to be stranger danger yeah they wanted it that maybe that you're andrew cuomo but <laughs> what they say is they wanted you to feel like you are the one who maybe came up on the book and found it and that you got transported to the island but later the stranger ends up being from earth which you fall through the starfisher which is like this void that goes into space in one of the ages that is not in the first game it's in riven this the sequel mm -hmm. and at the bottom of starfisher is or somewhere in there is where the one of the books and the books are links to other worlds which i'm trying to think of like the shortest way to explain all this and not take the four hours it took me to watch all this it's pretty it's like <laughs> sliders yeah basically books are like okay there's an ancient there's an ancient civilization called the Jinn. They figured out something called the art. The art is the ability to use some sort of sorcery or magic along with writing to create like alternate realities. Mm. And they call them and they call them ages. And you can transport to these ages, but you have to have a linked book. So when you touch the book, the window, it takes you, you disappear from your reality, the book stays there, and you get transported to the linked book in the other age. And that's how you transport between ages. There's a basically the father, Atris and Catherine, there's in the before the game takes place, there's a whole thing that happens. And in order without getting into the details, they escape Gen, who's like Atris's father, the grandpa, in his plots by they had they created the island of mist through this sorcery called the art as an, a place to escape to from this other guy. They escaped there and they stayed there and eventually like raised the family because they couldn't get back to like reality, reality because they didn't have a linked book. But eventually the brothers betray them and you end up basically, it's explained in the last game, one of the last linked books to Mist gets lost. It falls through this thing called the Starfisher and then nobody knows where it went. So you are presumably, wherever the book went, you presumably stumbled upon it touch the picture and because you don't know what's going on you have no linked book to get back you get taken to the island of mist and now you're trapped in the same place that they're trapped but they built this place as like a as an escape route a place to escape this other guy that's the shortest way i could explain it that sounds very complicated yeah yeah no i mean that that sounds about right when it comes to like retconned stories usually yes. there's a whole bunch of stuff that gets built around like well okay yes. we already did this in the first game so how the fuck do we make all this fit together but to be fair i think a lot of that uh, whether or not they had all those ideas from the get-go which i highly doubt anyway, highly doubt highly doubt it yeah very much doubt. i mean it, it seems like it fits all fits together i mean pretty well for what it's worth i think I do agree that it's it's a little odd, I guess, that there's a lot that is just like taken at face value, like that you're just somebody who just shows up and they're just like, oh, hey, a person's here. I'm not really going to ask why. But, you know, as far as like the writing and stuff specifically is concerned, if we're talking about just the first game and not any of the later editions of it or any of the, you know, uh, sequels or anything like that, unlike I think the majority of the games that we tend to talk about on the show, there is there is a lot of actual writing in this. And Chris already kind of, you know, alluded to this in the fact that you quite literally need to read a book in the game, several books, actually, um, which I think for me, at least, was very I have mixed feelings about it because on one hand, I do think it is cool and it, it is definitely a product of a different time as far as gameplay style is concerned i don't think there are a lot of games outside of some real esoteric like indie titles or things like that that would demand the player to just sit there and read a book for like a good solid 15 minutes to get an understanding of what's 
going on. Um, people don't, just don't, don't have like, the attention span for that anymore. Don't like reading books? Come play a video game. Psych, fuck you, read this book. <laughs> Final fuck, Fantasy there's still books. I can't escape. So apparently, Shane, you, I thought yes. you played Final Fantasy 13 and liked it. Yeah, I, I did, I did, yeah. <laughs> That's the same thing. If you want to know what's going on, you have to read books. I didn't know what was going on. All, all I knew was that I was there and I must kill. That's all I knew. Uh, Final Fantasy 13 is missed is missed six. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, the, the other part of it is while it is, I mean, looking back on it now, it, it may be kind of a big ask to to have somebody just sit there and read several books. I do, on the other hand, think it is a pretty cool way of really immersing you in that world, especially considering the whole plot device revolves around magical books, right? So it totally makes sense. And you are very much required to at least pay attention to those books that are there because you probably ought to take a lot of notes about the drawings and some of the the diagrams and things that you find uh, sprinkled throughout the pages of those books in that library because those are very important clues to figuring out a lot of the puzzles throughout the game. So I'm not sure if you guys agree with me or not. I will say that I felt the overall plot, such as it is for the first game, is not like particularly novel or complex. I think the idea of like the art and and the the books being links between these created worlds is is novel. But the idea of like, oh, they found out they could get power and then they became evil because power corrupts and they yes. betrayed yeah. us. Oh no. Is pretty boilerplate, honestly. Yeah, it's yep. pretty generic. Yeah. But I think it does greatly benefit from how it's presented though, in that you do piece together what has happened on this on this island and the subsequent ages very slowly, you know, as you progress through the game, you get little bits and pieces and then you kind of put everything together once you get towards the end. And I think that approach helps quite a bit. Did you guys have any preferences between the brothers? I mean, they both, they're both pretty terrible in my, in my mind, but I mean, I do have a preference. Did you guys have a preference whatsoever? I figured if you're going to be evil, you might as well be, uh, I forget which brother was the more like regal refined one. That's serious. That's the red one. Yeah. Serious. Yeah. See, if I'm going to be evil, I might as well be cool or that way. They're not, I don't know. It's like pick your poison S slightly to him, I suppose. Yeah, I don't know. It was tough for me because like on one hand, it, it was it was serious. It was in the Red Book, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I felt like he was very obviously like mustache twirlingly evil. And then the other guy, I honestly was mostly just annoyed by most of the time because of his like insane rambling that he was doing. Right. So I don't know. I'd prefer the, the the blue book. I think what is his name? Ichnar or something like that. Like if it was only a choice, like if I had to release one of the two brothers mm -hmm. and you didn't have the third choice, you didn't have the green book where they both get fucked, then it would have to be the blue book. Eknar. I'll just call him Eknar. I don't know what his fucking name is. I hopefully get that right. <laughs> the reason is, is because the red book was was talking to me like I was a fucking idiot. Uh, like, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, he obviously is the bad guy and I am I am perfectly good. Like, no, like it's obvious you're a manipulative prick and you're taking <laughs> I'm, I'm finding all these puzzles and pages for you and you think I'm too dumb to recognize that you're an asshole. OK, fuck you. The other guy's like, oh, 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 I'm going to uh, like, I'm crazy. Like, I know you're crazy. Um, I'll just I'll let you out of the book and put you in some meds. And if you need to be, you know, locked away and get some help for a little bit, then we'll do that. We'll take care of you. But yeah, the other guy is obviously he's too smart and he's going to fuck me over and kill me. So if I was going to take my odds and chances, I'd rather go with the blue book guy. I agree with your logic. Well, and I think that's a good way of going into the writing, right? Because we've talked about the plot and stuff, but the dialogue yeah. writing um, is passable. I, I, I don't think it's all that great, if I'm being honest. And frankly, the delivery of the lines really doesn't help it all that much. One of you can probably fact check me on this. I, I know it's probably right in the credits of the game, but I didn't really take the opportunity to look at it. I'm like almost 100 percent certain that the developers of the game were the ones that were playing the the parts of of like the the son and the, and the father is that is that right i'm pretty oh, sure that's know. right 
I didn't look that up either, but it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, it definitely felt very much like one of those. Well, honestly, an earlier game, like a PC title with like FMVs or something like that, where they didn't have the budget to hire like actual actors. And so they just got like random dudes on the development staff to play parts. And that's kind of how it felt. So um, I wasn't a huge fan of the line delivery most of the time. It definitely felt a little cheesy, but, you know, I guess they were working with what they had. I've seen much worse. Oh, well, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think the worst FMV sequence I've seen recently is I was trying an old PS1 game called Crazy Ivan uh, that has, you know, when they would just like Command and Conquer, where they just, it's like just shitty B right TV studio, bad lighting. <laughs> yeah, it gets worse. There's a whole world of bad FMV sequences and bad dialogue in, in the video game world. I think you're right. But it's not as bad as it gets. I don't know. I might be biased, but I actually, I, I think the FMVs from Command and Conquer were better than these. No, oh, I would say those are cheesy in like the uh, endearing way. I definitely yeah, like it's them. It's also yeah. a couple years later, too. Yeah. True. That's true. I still think Kane did a pretty good job. Kane was all right. Yeah. yeah he's pretty good. Yeah. I think these guys are okay, too. I don't think, I'm, I don't think they're that bad. Yeah. I could take it or leave it, but yeah. uh, I suppose we should probably move on. So this is yeah. probably going to be the chunk of what we talk about here. I think let's chat about the gameplay such such as it is. Who, who'd like to take that one first? I took it first last time. Someone else can go. OK, I'll go because mine's going to be short. There you go. Uh, it's a walking simulator, even in the, re- the mastered masterpiece edition. So it's not great because the genre, I, I would say you should. So one of you said in your notes that you could say it's almost like the spiritual predecessor to walking simulators. So I think it gets some cred for that. But when you play the Masterpiece Edition and you've played other more modern walking simulators, it's serviceable, but it's just kind of like, I would rather go finish like What Remains of Edith Finch or was it, or Ethan Fisher, forget Mm -hmm. that one. I started, it's really good. I didn't finish it. But um, as far as walking simulators go, you need better atmosphere and graphics and masterpiece edition is better than the original, but it's much like you were saying with the voice acting, the actual game is put together. It feels like a fan project. I mean, it works, but it's not just like a great, it just doesn't feel and play awesome when you move around stiff. And I don't know, I, it hooked me for about an hour and a half. And then I was like, fuck this. I'll just watch lore videos. Cause I want to find out what's going on. So that's all you really need to know is I couldn't force myself to, I even bought it on steam for like, I'm for 14 bucks. I was like, I'm going to make myself play it. And it's like, fuck my $14. It's not worth it. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, okay. So here, here's the thing, right? Is that I am, I'm about to probably tear into a lot of the aspects of this game, but I want to preface this by saying that having a better understanding of where the Millers were coming from when they were developing this and what they were working with, I think gives me a better, a better view of the end result and probably softens my, my thoughts on it yes. a little bit. And, and this is where we mentioned it a little while ago, but that hypercard thing that actually blows my fucking mind that they were developing their first few games with this technology called HyperCard that was on Apple Max. And essentially it was just like kind of what it says is that you would develop static images or or animated GIFs, which they ended up doing um, and putting them on these card tiles, essentially. And the whole system would be you would programmatically link these tiles together through button actions. It's It's pretty simple, but it works perfectly for this kind of game, a point and click adventure. It's, it fits it, you know, to a T. And so that's what they used. And then this game was developed on that. So if you think about the black and white games that they made prior to this, the fact that they built Mist, which leverages, you know, three dimensional rendered environments that were then, you know, compressed down into these images. And putting that on top of this somewhat older hypercard system um, is actually pretty impressive. I, I have to give them credit for that, that they made that work the way that it does. But it also kind of informs you a little bit more of why the game is the way it is, because under the hood, 
it is quite literally like fucking flashcards. It's just flashcards. That are just yes. popping up every time you click something. That's that's really all it is. And so that's why you end up getting this real stiff, you know, feeling of clicking through each of these screens. So I have I have some nitpicks about this. Maybe some. not particularly surprising. So as Cade mentioned, it is quite literally point and click for better or worse. And I'll say often, I think worse in, in my experience with the game, largely because of just some like very particular things that the game engine does or doesn't do in that it's very particular about which areas of the screen you need to click in order to navigate properly in some places. And I found myself in on several occasions just straight up missing very important areas um, that I would need to explore because I had no idea that I could click to go there. Yeah, 100 percent. Yes. Yeah. Very true. The thing that comes to mind immediately is the tree trunk puzzle in order to get to one of those areas. Yeah. I hate the puzzle anyway, uh, as is because I fucking hate most of the puzzles in this game. But like that one was supremely annoying because the tree that you had to go to, which you were under a timer to get to um, in order to progress, by the way, once you figured out the puzzle to actually make that work properly. You had to now granted the tree was like literally right next to the little shack that you were standing in, but the fucking path to get there was so hidden. I assume unintentionally. I don't know, but like I didn't even know it was there. And like I went and looked at the walkthrough and it was like, just go to the big tree. And I'm like, fuck you. What big tree? There's (laughs) like a thousand trees out here. Which one are you talking about? And I just randomly stumbled across it finally. And I was like, oh, my God, are you kidding me? And and that's just like one example of, of that kind of thing happening. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, you have anything else to say or is it time for me to jump in? Because I'm going to pretty much touch a lot of things you did. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not done yet. I'll keep going. Oh, Fuck go it. for it. Yeah, please <laughs> yeah. do. OK, great. I had the same uh, problem with that fucking tree because there's like only oh, like fuck. a there's like a foot area you have to click on to get to it. And you just happen to have to see it to even know you're even supposed to go there. There's no right. identifier. Exactly. And and so speaking of this, like where or what to click thing, I, I am not a huge fan of most of the interactive items that you find throughout a lot of these ages because they are, they serve no purpose now. And I, I don't know if the intention on on the behalf of the Miller brothers was to include little fun flavor items throughout the world. Um, like there was one and I think it was the mechanical age where in one of the rooms there were these three like little different colored gems on top of like a desk or something or a bureau <laughs> that would light up when you click them. <laughs> Those do nothing. There's no purpose for them. Or like the fact that there's like a chessboard that's sitting at the foot of like a throne and you click and you are brought to a screen that focuses on this chessboard and you're like, oh, this motherfucking chessboard this is key. I got to figure out what to do with this chessboard. No, no, there's no point to it. There's no reason for it to be there. And that happens a lot. So the cynical part of me thinks that they placed these things there purposefully just to like throw you off. And that to me was just supremely frustrating because I remember, well, first of all, I didn't even get this far when I was a kid. So fuck the mechanical age or whatever. But like even just like trying to figure out what to do and where to go when you have these things that are there and are interactive, but serve no purpose at all to progressing the story. That's just so frustrating to have to weed out what is and is not important. And I don't know, like maybe there's somebody out there that's just like super into that and good for you. But like, that's the kind of thing that makes me want to just like throw the game down and go play something else. I mean, fuck it while, while I'm on this rant, because why not? Right. Like <laughs> literally the first puzzle, the first puzzle that you get to when you get your happy ass dropped onto this island unceremoniously is you, you find this note on the ground. Right. That's just like, right. go, go to this area. Well, f- find, find all the switches on the Island and then go to this area and input the number of switches into this panel to see this secret message I have left for you. And you're like, okay, I guess that's pretty straightforward. So you wander around the Island trying to find all the switches. There's eight of them fucking spoiler, by the way. But like the problem is answer is like, 
one of them is also on an island, a, a smaller island, an island within an island, if you will, that is currently inaccessible to you. So it's also really easy to miss because it's out there and it's in the distance and it's hard to see. So that's issue number one. But if you figure out how many switches there are, the place that the note tells you to go, it's not like there's just a panel right there that's like, I will punch in this number. No, no, no. It's hidden behind like this completely irrelevant piece of paper that's posted on the wall with some like information and numbers that doesn't have to do with fucking anything at all. The only way to open this hidden panel that's behind this piece of paper is to click a very dark colored button that is in the top left corner in the shadows. I was wandering around for like 20 fucking minutes trying to figure out what the hell to do. I even had a walkthrough. I had the walkthrough open on my other screen <laughs> and it was just like just fucking go to the panel man just put in the fucking number just is right there and i'm like fuck you what panel <laughs> and i had to go on youtube and watch a, a walkthrough of somebody doing a long play to finally see oh there's a button there that's an immediate fuck this game to me you know i'm just like you know what i'm out like if this is how the rest of this is going to be and spoilers it is then like <laughs> I, I don't know what to do with that it's 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 frustrated me so much here here i concur i'm sorry where did mist touch you i, I, I wow I, I, you know i could show you but it's like very oh. obscure and hidden and you'll never actually see it <sighs> that's that's what my wife tells me too so <laughs> I don't know what to say here because no, I, like your complaints are valid. They're extremely valid. But this is something that I still remember, like when you talk about the, the, the paper and how you couldn't find it. This is something I remember finding when I was eight, you know, not when I didn't have walkthroughs and I didn't have this. This okay, isn't well, trying. This isn't me fuck trying to you like too, Chris, like be superior <laughs> here. <laughs> like, I'm, but I remember finding like, these uh, things. Even a child could find this. Even a child could find it. I'm sorry. You, if you find the door, you walk in. The only way out is to turn around. You see the paper. And if you're exploring everything, you see a button, you click the button. I could, that's the thing, though. I couldn't see the button. Uh, the, the button's pretty visible, even on the Saturn. The, the graphics were such that it was in a shadow. Like, I didn't even know it was there. Well, that's why, apparently, I guess on the Mac version, the graphics were just superior to the PC one. So it's OK. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. That's what it must be. That being said, all your complaints are... Like totally valid. There's there's some serious problems with with some of the puzzles to this game. And it's not even so like they're so hard to figure out the way you get to the various ages is that you without a walkthrough, without a guide, because you can do this without a walkthrough or a guide or doing a lot of things you're supposed to do uh, throughout the game. And the one impetus you get to go to any of these ages, you go to the library. The library is essentially your main hub for the island. Mm -hmm. And you rotate the tower and you point it to the age or a direction you want to go to because you don't know you're going to a different age the first time you're playing it. It's just you point it in direction. The line turns red and then you knock down the library doors and you go up and it gives you, hey, these are here's a puzzle solution and here's the age it's going to go to. Now, you don't necessarily go to the location it shows you in the tower, which is a big fuck you. <laughs> but if you've been exploring the island and looking into things you can get a general idea of what you're supposed to be doing. So what's the first one? The mechanical age where it says like 240 and then 221 is, yeah. is the solution to the puzzle. And it points you right at the the gears that are on the island, which is one of the first things you see. You go to the gears and there's you, you can't fucking do anything with that. So that's kind of bullshit. But if you go to the if the only place on the entire island where there's a clock if you go there and you set the time, then you can go in there and then there's three numbers and like, oh, OK, this makes sense. It opens up. You see gears. You click on the you. So you, you look at it like, oh, what could this do? You go to the gears. The gears are open, much like the gears of the clock. You can go in there. Great. I think that if you have enough time and patience and you really don't have anything fucking better else to do in your life, you can figure <laughs> this shit out. You can you you can do this. It's not impossible. Now, where you, I have significant problems, a lot of them you brought up. A lot of the, 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 the solution to the puzzles, specifically the tree, they're hidden from you. You're not told that, hey, like you go into that shack with uh, the, the furnace and building the pressure and everything like that. And it has a picture of a tree and you're like, OK, cool. So you light it and it's just doing some things and like I I don't know what to do with this. 
Like, OK, so it's making big noises and it has a tree here. I haven't seen any tree like that. There is no indication where this tree is or what she's supposed to do with the tree. The other one is to go to what the Senolinic age. And first, I'm going to rant on the Senolinic age. Fuck that age is uh, you have to power the spaceship to power the spaceship. You have to get exactly 59 volts. But if you go over 59, 59 volts, the breakers bust. Guess what? How do you get to the breakers? There's nothing that says there's any breakers. There's nothing that tells you why it won't get any voltage. There's there's nothing. You have to take obscure paths and climb a ladder and flip breakers. And there's two sets of them. And you're not going to know that unless and it, it, there's no natural path to get to these things. So everything is very hidden. The other problem. And, and you know what? When you're complaining about all these items that mean nothing, that's just trolling adventure game fans. So I'm laughing at you. So ha 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 ha. You're trying to think too much into it. I get it. You're an adventure fan. You played Monkey Island, and everything like that. That's fine. But you get to the Centralinic Age and OK, you have to do some thought processing. That's fine. Everything's cool. But it relies on the fact that you solved a problem in the mechanical age. And this game is supposed to be nonlinear. So if you want to do the rocket ship first, because rocket ships are cool, you go to the rocket ship first and then it tells you what direction you, there's at the end of the Centralinic Age. If you figure out the puzzles, which are still pretty difficult to figure out in and of themselves, but it's possible. You get to the settle Linux age and you have this like roller cart level that like at the very end of it, Ugh. you can only do it, navigate it properly through the use of audio cues, which are fucking terrible, by the way. They sound goofy as fuck, but you have <laughs> to hear the audio cues in order to know which direction you're supposed to go. There is nothing in the settle Linux age that tells you what these sounds mean. You have to have done the mechanical age first in order to understand what the sounds are telling you. So if you went to the Centralinic age, that would be terrible. Not to mention, and I, I saw this in your notes too, Shane, uh, that the fact that you can only get one page at a time, which isn't a big deal for most of the ages, but the Centralinic age, you have to do that roller coaster ride every single time to get out of it. And that thing lasts forever. Well no, it is a big deal. It is a big deal for every one of the fucking ages. Not really. Because you have to. OK, you know what? Actually, besides that one, because you're right. But the other thing that actually bothered me, probably an equal amount, maybe a little bit less, but it was actually one point where I almost quit. And you and I were talking about this in, in Discord while we were playing through this prior to the yeah. episode. But it was uh, I don't even remember the name of the age now. It was the one with the boats. It's the uh, stone something stone. Age. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that you had to go back in and go through the whole series of powering up the generator by just standing there and cranking for like a minute, a minute, and then going and pumping the water out from one area, going down, getting the page, going back to the fucking like compass, clicking the right button based on the degrees that you found in the looking glass to then like turn the lights on and everything in the hull of the ship then pump the water back out, go down inside the ship, go through the book to get back to the Mist Island to deliver the page and then do that shit all over again for the other page. Because if you want the quote unquote real ending or the good ending, you need to bring back both pages from every single age. Like oh, I almost quit. You can get the good ending without both. You just won't get all the exposition. Well, OK, fine. Um, I, if you want to see everything, then you should bring back both. And that's what I was trying to do. That was the point right there where I almost quit because I was like, <laughs> you're telling me I have to go through each one of these sequence of steps fucking basically three times twice if you happen to hang on to one of the pages in your first time through. But like, would it have killed them to just have like some real rudimentary like inventory system? Yeah, it's based off adventure games. They should have. I, I don't know anything about hypercard, but I've done enough programming in my life professionally to know that like. Y'all could have just thrown like a real simple variable in there that says like has red page. Yes or no. Like fucking a like having to go through all that shit multiple times is just so exhausting. And one last thing while we're talking about the pages. Sure. First of all, because when you when you first get into the game and you open up these books and I understand they have a page next to the book, you put the page into the book to get information. They're so broken up and distorted. It doesn't really let you know that the entire objective of the game is to find pages. It doesn't make that known at all. Mm -hmm. So when they put you in these age, it feels really stupid. It feels like the entire point of going into the age is getting out of the age. Like there's there's no really re real reward. Because once you get out of the age, you just go back to Mist Island. 
So why would you want to go to an age? What's the point? It doesn't really drive that home. Now, if you if you understand that you're trying to get one of these these pages of the books back into the books in order to end the game. Yeah, sure. That's fine. But it does such a bad job because it's broken up. And I understand, like, once you get the books, once you get the pages in there, it does a better job of explaining things. And that's why, you know, go back to plot. Why I like the plot and I like the way it was told. But the fact that it doesn't really let you know that that's your objective is a complete and total failure on the game's part, because it it doesn't really drive you if you don't know you're supposed to be getting these pages to go to other ages and see what's going on there. If it just drops you there and you're supposed to go you find a way out. That that's all it is. Oh, I got trapped in a new age. How did I get out? Like, that's not very exciting. That's that's not very interesting unless, you know, that's what you're supposed to be doing. Right. And it does not do a good job of doing that. Yeah. And I think, uh, listen, uh, at the end of the day, I am definitely and I'll talk about this once we get to the end of whether or not it holds up today, because I have some thoughts and suggestions. But like I actually, despite the huge rant I just went on, I, I actually do appreciate good, you know, puzzle adventure games. I really do. The issue here is that I never and even when I was a kid and to this day, I never thought that the implementations of the puzzles in Myst were ever particularly elegant or well done. They're not communicated well. They're like obscure almost just for the sake of being obscure. And it does not give you enough to go on as a player to to really intuitively solve these puzzles and it just feels like it takes way too much trial and error to finally figure out the like hyper specific thing that they want you to do like the tree one again going back to that is a perfect example because even before you know finding the tree itself the whole thing of having to light the boiler and then turn the the wheel to you know get the pressure going or something all the way to one side and then you specifically have to wait for the clanking noise that it makes when it's when you do that to completely stop and then immediately turn the wheel all the way in the other direction to get the mechanism to start working nothing communicates that whole sequence of events to you at all and that part is, I think, what frustrates me the most. If there had been some better, I'm not asking for my hand to be held through these things because that honestly defeats a lot of the purpose of a puzzle adventure, but just some better sign postage, man, like something to guide the player a little bit better is really all I'm asking for. I don't know, Cage, you've been super quiet. Have we have we just totally lost you at this point? <laughs> no, <laughs> the gameplay sucks. <laughs> he's just way more yeah. succinct about it he's like yeah i know it it sucks i got it, it fucking blows man i mean i watched i watched a lot of the puzzle so i could be aware of like all the different ages and be reminded but like i said i played it for a little bit it was like i don't care that i spent money on this but i am intrigued about the the like the world and the lore and the writing mm. and then i ended up getting sucked into like four hours of videos so i think that you know, if you can get through the gameplay and you can, in my opinion, like white knuckle through it, there is a cool <laughs> plot and story, especially the series as a whole. Yeah. Riven is, from what I can tell, Riven, which I haven't played, but from watching more gameplay footage, fixes a lot of these issues. And it also- It's a lot more riveting. <laughs> Boo. Uh, I don't know if I should laugh or be sad. Both. <laughs> both. I should be both. But I think he said in the interview that we watched, Shane- they spent a lot of time trying to think of puzzles that are not just arbitrary, but actually fit into the world and the lore. And there's a reason that puzzle is set up. And they had started retconning and building the lore for Riven. And they also fixed a lot of just reading people's comments in the community and the forums. Mm-hmm. It seems like a lot of the stuff you're complaining about is fixed in Riven. There's a lot more. There's also more dialogue. There's more acting. It's just bigger, bigger budget more refined. They had done more play testing. So I think that if someone were to play it, yeah, gear up for a really rough gameplay. But my, if I wanted to be positive about it, you can get rewarded with some cool lore and some cool atmosphere. Yeah. If that's a driving force enough for you to get through the game, then great. If not, just go watch it on YouTube and just fuck the game. <laughs> yeah. And, and you are right. Actually, the, the funny thing is about all of this, that if for nothing else, 
I think this whole experience just made me want to play Riven because <laughs> I, I never had either, honestly, because Mist just put me right the fuck off from this forever. Our job here is done. like, yeah, well, it's true, because like, even though, you know, again, the positive aspect of this is and it's funny because this exact dichotomy was brought up by the one one of the brothers in this interview that Kate and I both watched. He said it like to a fucking T. So I know I'm not alone in this. Like he even recognizes this because he's just flat out said he's like, I'm pretty sure that like maybe 50 percent of the people that played this game ever got off the fucking first island. Just period. He's like, but having said that, I I'm always approached by people and they always say the same thing, which is basically like uh, you know i your game was super impenetrable and i never fucking made it very far but like i always think about it fondly because it left this 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 image this this legacy in my mind of like just being this very mysterious like esoteric kind of world that always drew me in and i wanted to know more about it and i think in that way it it is a triumph that it has that kind of a legacy for so many people And even though I have a lot to complain about here, it is kind of the same for me. You know, I was that impressionable age at the time. And so even though going back to it now and seeing it as it is, it still has that kind of otherworldly quality. And so I do have to give them props for that at the very least. And you can get all of that and enjoy all of that without playing the game. That (laughs) that is true. I kind of disagree. And honestly, that's the thing, right, is like. If you know what to do in this game, you can get it done in about two hours tops. Yeah. Yeah. But I I disagree that you get everything out of it. Just that's true. You don't get the frustration. No, there's. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you just you get rid of all the shit. I'll get that into into whether or not it holds up. Like watching YouTube video is not going to give the same experience as playing this game. I wholeheartedly disagree. But before we get to that, let me explain why when we talk about the graphics, but I'll let Shane Mm. start off on the graphical fidelity and then I'll talk about as to why I think the graphics are the major leading cause as to why you need to play this game as opposed to watch it on YouTube. So go ahead. Yeah, sure. So again, we're we're not at least we're not. Um, I know Kate had a little bit of a different experience, but. I'm specifically talking about the the OG pre-rendered graphics, not the the fancied gussied up ones that they put in in Real Mist and some of the re-releases. But listen, man, those pre-rendered backgrounds were something special, especially in like 1993. I mean, they're pixelated as fuck now, but I mean back then, the just the sheer level of detail that went into every single frame, and they are quite literally frames went a long way, you know, to, to making this a very immersive experience. It's the par- a huge reason why people praise it as much as they do is because of that. And the use of early 3D modeling software to build out each one of these environments and then create the, the static images from those 3D renders was a real big deal then. And so I, I honestly... From that angle, I I don't really have a whole lot bad to say. The gripes that I have really is just sort of a product of being several decades in the future where we're at now, which is just like there are some things like a a prime example of this. And this might not have been the case for you guys, depending on where you played it. But for me anyway, being on, you know, a high def widescreen monitor, the writing in, in the library books was so low res Mm -hmm. that I actually had difficulty reading it. Like I had to sit back from my screen and kind of do that thing where you like cross your eyes for like those magic eye puzzles to like actually see a lot of the words. And by the way, if you are young enough that um, your public schools stopped teaching cursive to you, you might be proper fucked trying to read (laughs) these books because it is all in cursive. So good luck with that. Yeah. Pixelated cursive. Yeah, it's it is a challenge to like to actually read that stuff properly. I mean, other than that, that's really the only minor gripe. Like this was doing something that pretty much nobody else was doing at the time in the way that they did it. So it was groundbreaking for sure. Okay, go ahead. I played the Real Mist Masterpiece Edition. It's good. The graphics are good. Like the texture works good. The lighting is good. They took they basically mo- built a 3D model based on the reference, the frames from the original game. So in the sense of like someone had to actually build out this world, I don't think that 
they had the original 3D models. I tried to find this out. I was digging around. I couldn't find a confirmation. But my guess would be that they didn't have the original 3D models that they did the renders off because that would have been in such a archaic format. Mm. And the chance of that like surviving and when you hear things about like all these big publishers that lose code and ver- source code of their games all the time, I just someone went through and remodeled the whole game based off references, which is pretty cool. I think for that, it's cool. The texture, again, the texture work, lighting was good. And then I watched probably about 30 to 45 minutes of the original, just to remind myself of what it looked like originally. And I agree with everything you said. The original had more nostalgia. And because it is a walking simulator, I almost thought like maybe if I would have played the original, the like the dopamine from the nostalgia might have pushed me through more of the puzzles mm-hmm. and just saying like, I don't want to do this because... This is just kind of like a bare bones walking simulator. Right. Yeah. So the Masterpiece Edition looks good, but it's not good enough to make up for it. It might be better to play the original if you have fond memories of it. What about you, Chris? What, what are your thoughts? So graphically, it's, it's old. I think we all recognize that. Like the pre-render graphics, they're, they're of state of the art in 1993. And I do recommend that if you are going to play this game, don't play it on the Saturn. That was the most convenient uh, path of least resistance for me, which is why I played it. It's very easy for me to play any Saturn game right now because of, you know, the mode, not because I can fucking buy it. Like, no, I'm not three right. console Christmas Chris anymore. It's been a long time. In terms of like the Saturn, because it just, it can't play MPEGs as high quality as the PlayStation or, or a lot of other systems of the time. So don't play the Saturn version. Or I'd even say 3D OCD, I Jaguar CD, but if you even have a Jaguar CD that works. <laughs> so play the PC version uh, if you can, if, if you want, if you need to play it. That being said, the presentation that, that it gives you graphically, when after you read those books in the library and just everything being so empty, uh, it, it feels very surreal. And that's the word I heard you use earlier, Shane. It's very surreal. Yeah, it's on the box. Yeah, yeah, I don't have the box. I'll take your word for it. But almost like a surreal, supernatural feeling to it. Mm -hmm. So if you're watching it on YouTube, you're probably just watching it to find a solution to a puzzle. And that's perfectly acceptable and perfectly fine because this game can be uh, ostensibly obtuse. It's stubbornly obtuse. It just wants to be very difficult for you to figure out what the fuck's going on. Okay. now the entire environment, the way it's set up is creepy. It doesn't necessarily mean to be creepy, but just everything being empty. And I would say this is the reason I wanted to go last on this is because it really ties into the sound direction. So when you have graphics like these, if you don't have a sound direction like you do, so I'm tying this in the sound. So, haha, there's your segue. I love it. Like the, the way that the music itself lends itself to an empty environment. It leads itself to a very static, you know, a human or just life deprived environment. And, you know, sometimes you do get like rendered birds flying in the background if you're paying attention, which is kind of cool or or wind moving through at certain points and all that kind of stuff. But it just it made me feel like I was abandoned. It made me feel like there should be something here, but there's not. And even goes back to what I was saying when I first played this game, that I always felt like something was going to come out, jump out and attack me. Like Mm -hmm. a a survival horror feeling. And no, there's no enemies in this game. There's nothing to worry about. You won't be touched. You cannot die because of an enemy. The only thing you can get is probably soft locked by not figuring out a puzzle. And then (laughs) that's that. But and that can happen relatively easily. But just the simple fact that the game could do that. And that's why you're not going to get the same experience watching it off YouTube. It's not something you can watch. And like a lot of these modern games where it's so plot driven through cutscenes and and dialogue there's there's a certain uh je ne sais quoi that you have to do in order to see all these uh, like the brothers rooms and clicking through everything it's not to throw you off for puzzle reasons i know if you're a big adventure mm. player you're you're going to think that but mm. it's to show the dis- disposition of the brothers and and who they were and whether or not you can trust them, because that's always a question leading up into the final act, which I mean, if you're completely fucking stupid, um, you won't know. But I mean, you figure that out relatively early, but it is to show what was going on, what they were doing to the local populace is why things fell into ruin. That's very important. And you can't get that from a YouTube video in the same 
same method you're getting it from your own self exploration through the graphical and sound presentation now the actual sounds themselves they suck i was just talking about like <laughs> navigating through like the 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 roller coaster ride and like the dongs and the pings and the the spring sound they're garbage they're not very good but the yeah. actual musical there direction are several puzzles that rely on that shit too <laughs> yes there are and they're bad but the uh, actual graphical presentation and the music that goes along with it really drive the presentation of this game home and makes it a game that you have to play if you want the full experience of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I actually tend to agree with you there. And, and as far as like the, the sound is concerned, the score is absolutely the standout here. I don't have a whole lot to say on any of the sound effects. They're there. They they work. I they guess suck. they do what they need to do. <laughs> They're they're not great, but they did make some real solid choices with the soundtrack. It it fits the ambiance very, very well, and it does absolutely contribute to that very desolate, almost alien feeling at times. So so no, kudos to them for that. The voice clips honestly are, are pretty compressed, but I mean, again, you kind of have to expect that from from this era, especially trying to fit everything on on a disc um, in the way that they needed to, which is something I'll talk about in a little bit in our miscellaneous tidbits. You know, the one thing that I noticed, by the way, about the sound effects stuff is that uh, maybe it was just me. I don't think it is. But uh, a lot of them did sound like they were just kind of taken from like one of those super generic, like stock sound effects libraries that you can purchase from Claris like works. F- y- yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that those were just taken wholesale from one of those things because having and and honestly, it kind of takes you out of the experience a little bit. I'm going to be real with you. Like when you're trying to solve this puzzle in this like abandoned fucking world with gears and tree houses and whatever the hell else. And like you have to solve a puzzle based on a boing noise like that. It kind of pulls me out just a little bit. (laughs) Just a tad. I mean, how about you, Kate? I mean, these sounds are bad. I mean, they're not like an elephant for for a sound of a dragon like Sui Koden bad, but they're bad. So what do you think? I'm trying to think. Is there really an elephant sound for a dragon sound in Sui Koden? I'm trying to think. Yes. Wait, what part? <laughs> when you when you take the dragon to fly on the dragon. The very first game when yeah. you get Fitch, the first. Yeah. I don't remember elephant? the dragon sounding like an elephant. You need I think to go. this is some fake ass news, dude. <laughs> you need to go what look it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's real news. <laughs> Um, well, that's, uh, debatable. We can <laughs> shelf that for later. I have to go back and listen to Hold it. Hold on. The only reason I'm giving him shit, because I know that's his favorite game of all time, but now he has to go look no, it up. No, that's, no, Sui Coden 2 is my favorite game of all time. Same thing. No. No. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. Oh my God. Do you want to ruin this podcast? Because I can. I'm ready to go right now. <laughs> I will turn this Fuck thing missed. around. <laughs> I will turn this bus around. No more yelling on the bus. <laughs> Oh shit! What was I gonna say? Oh, sound. I would say you're probably right, Shane. Based on that interview you watched, and it was just the two of them, they probably did just whatever they could get access to, whatever they had. Yeah. What I find interesting is that on that same interview, they were talking about how they had to organize the data in a way that it would be physically close to data that would be needed on the yes. CD because they were worried about the read and the write speed of the like one next speed, like regular speed. C drives that basically everyone would be using. And so they would have to put the sounds in the slides like clustered together physically on the CD. So that all coming together, it's they they probably just took the cheapest, easiest sounds they had access to and compressed the shit out of them because they were worried about space. They were worried about um, hitting that two second um, goal of of when you interact with something, which when they said, when he said that in the video, uh, for those who haven't seen the video, he references, he, I guess one of the creators heard from somebody in the industry that people need to have some sort of feedback within two seconds. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it'll be confusing. And I thought two seconds is so slow, (laughs) so slow for like, and anyway, but that, that's what they were going for. They had all this, this limitation with the, not just the size of the disks, but the, the speed of the disks and the read and write speed. I think you could basically take it home and just assume that they took whatever sound library they had access to, compressed the shit out of them and just picked what they had. They might've even picked sounds that were not, that might've, they might've thrown away sounds that might've fit better, but they were too big or they took up too much space or they were too long. Mm-hmm. 
So I think sound is, but other than the actual music, I think the music is decent. If I was making that game and I had the intuition that visuals were a big part and I needed to cut some corners, sound is where I would cut the corner. And it, <laughs> pun intended, it sounds like that's where they cut corners. <laughs> there it is. Two can play this game, Chris. <laughs> You're welcome. Please don't. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean, and that also functions as a fantastic segue into the last little bit that we want to touch on here before we talk about whether this thing holds up. And that's just some of the miscellaneous little facts that we come across during our, you know, investigations into the game um, before we talk about it on the show. And yeah, a few things that I found particularly interesting, especially being someone that's in the technology field, was just kind of how this thing came together. I am. I am impressed that they managed to pull this whole thing off, frankly. One thing of particular note, right, is they had begun development on Myst on a black and white Macintosh SE. In case you didn't notice, the game's in color. So that seems a little weird, right? In order for them to see the colors, in or to, to even render the environments properly to make sure they knew what the hell they were doing, they quite literally had to pop open the back of that PC and attach a third party product that was called a Scuzzy Graph 2, which is a fantastic name, by the oh, way. Kudos Scuzzy. to their marketing department. That would literally clip onto the processor inside the machine that would basically mod it so that they could have a monitor attached that would give them full color so they could see what the hell they were doing. Like, that's insane to me that they even had to do that in the first place. And then, yeah, the thing about CD ROM stuff, um, Cade was just talking about that, where relatively speaking, especially for home computing, CD-ROM drives were still relatively new. And so they did not have access to a CD burner. And what that means basically is they could not test uh, the read write so speeds of the game as they were developing it. CD burners at the time cost several thousand dollars to purchase because um, that was a pretty specialized piece of hardware. And so their major concern was the fact that most consumer grade CD-ROM drives were single speed, unlike, you know, the quad eight, 10 speed drives that we ended up with later on down the road. And so they weren't even sure that the game assets were going to load quick enough to for anybody to play it properly. And so they kind of had to fly through a lot of the development of this game, like mostly blind and just pray that when they got that gold master copy printed that they were going to pop it in the drive and everything was going to work the way that they wanted it to. And and the fact that they had to be that meticulous, as Cade was pointing out, about actually having to think about where the data is physically going to be stored on that disk such that the stuff that is related is close enough together on those read rings on the CD for it to have load quick enough without having, you know, uh, a seek time that was going to go beyond what would be appreciable for somebody to properly play through the game. That, especially in this day and age, just like blows my fucking mind that that is something they had to consider. But, you know, you have to think about the the time period that this was in and, and what they had to deal with. So they, they overcame a lot. Yeah. One thing I want to add real quick there for anyone saying, you know, they could just put it on a hard drive and you could play it off the hard drive as opposed to them thinking about how it could load off a CD directly off a PC. You have to remember mm. 650 megabytes, which is the standard storage for a CD back then, even now, for the most part, 650 megabytes was a huge part of your hard drive in 1993, mm -hmm. if not more than your hard drive. This is why CDs were big data storage capacities. Remember, zip drives were 100 megabytes and they were gigantic in 1999. So Having a CD with 650 megabytes, it had to stream off the CD onto your computer. They just couldn't put it on your hard drive and have your hard drive do all the work like we do today. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. And because of that, and because they didn't have access to the CD burner, in that same interview, he describes optimizing the game as intuition. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> He's like, we went off intuition. Like we didn't really know. And he just like, and he also describes, we got the gold master CD and we like to think that they've got all the way to gold print and still didn't know if the game was going to even work. I mean, in some alternate bizarro timeline, that game never came out. Right. You know? Yeah. Right. It's like, it, it's just, that was really, really interesting for me. When I watched that video, I thought that was, I mean, I'm sure the industry is full of all sorts and that same channel. It's called Ars Technica. 
Mm -hmm. Their series is called War Stories, and I found a few more, and it's like crazy development stories about a bunch of games, and uh, it's really good. So there's that too. Yeah, no, for sure. It's it's crazy just how much luck I think goes into a lot of these things that turn out way better than I think anybody expected. Turned out to be 6.5 million sales and made that dude unbelievably wealthy and (laughs) just flying by the seat of his pants the whole time. It's wild. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. And speaking of the sales numbers, one little quick one before we move on here, just for a point of comparison, in case any, we didn't drive this home enough already. In the year 1996, in, in the top 10 PC games that sold that year, Mist beat out Warcraft 2 by roughly 20,000 copies. Wow. Just just as a point of reference. That's nuts. Yeah. That's insane. That, that is nuts. I mean, I knew the game was big and I knew it was popular, but I really had no idea that it was it sold that well. Like cuz you would ask like what's bigger, Warcraft or, or Mist? It's like Warcraft had yeah, to have been obviously. way bigger. Yeah. Well, for us. Yes. I mean, you have to think Mist was kind of like like the Sims was. I mean, I guess it's even a direct comparison. You think about who, again, going back to what I said earlier, who owned computers in 1993? People who needed computers. So if you had gaming yeah. computers like business, very business driven, people who had money, the affluent, I don't even say people who needed computers because people who certainly didn't need computers were having it because they had money to spend on. So those were the people who were having it. So who was using, who was like, oh man, I've been working all day on a computer. I need to blow off some steam. It was business executives. It was your people who weren't typically gamers. So when you draw that parallel line to a game like The Sims, Sims, which ultimately usurped it, you talk to most people in 2000 about The Sims. And most gamers won't even, I mean, gamers that we know, gamers that are in our circle, won't have much of any of an opinion on it. Uh, But they could tell you about a host of other games. They could probably go wax poetic about Diablo 2, but they couldn't tell you shit about The Sims. However, I feel like I'm being personally attacked right now. You are. And <laughs> <laughs> but this is the same with Miss. Like, yeah, you ask us, you ask our circle, what was a bigger game in 1996, Mist or Warcraft 2? Like, fuck, yeah, Warcraft 2. That game's legendary. Sure. But most people aren't us. Most people were playing Mist. And that's just that's the weird reality of it. Yeah, for sure. I have one more mis- miscellaneous thing I wanted to add. I'm a no- I didn't get in my notes. Sure. But there is a game that is similar to Mist in the v- creepy vibe that I was wondering, and it took me a while to remember the name of it, and I found it, and I'm, I was hoping that either of you might have played it. It's called The Secret Island of Dr. Quandry. Nope. Mm, no, I can't say I've even heard of that. Bummer town. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to do some videos on it. It was a game that was in my elementary school Mac lab and it has a very similar premise and it came out, I want to say it most likely came out before Mist, but I don't know that for sure. Mm -hmm. You get, you go to a carnival, you meet this weird carny dude, you play a game, he transports you to a mystical island full of puzzles that you have to solve to escape the island. Hmm. Sound familiar? I mean, maybe. Very familiar. But it's way more uh, like just weird. I don't know how to explain it. Anyway, if that tickles your fancy, look it up on YouTube. It's it's an interesting, rare game. Hmm. Just watch some footage. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. All right. So I guess we're at the point where we need to talk about whether or not we feel this game still holds up today. And so, Chris, I'm going to have you go first. Uh, Sure. No. Great. So I actually like this game. I don't I don't hate this game at all. I I enjoyed my playthrough of this game, even though I was using it with a guide for most puzzles if I got too lost in it. Uh, But no, it's old. It feels old. Uh, You can have a much better experience with other games, as Kate said, with what remains of Edith Finch. Uh, We played a game. We streamed it in Discord called Devotion. There are a lot of games that really represent Myst better than Myst ever could today. It's iconic. It's legendary. It deserves its place in the pantheon of video games as inspirational and important. But it's probably in fact, no, not even probably. It's not a game you should go back and play. Not at all. (laughs) Unless you like torture. So no, don't play it. All right. Well, I guess I guess I'll take it next. Uh, So. All right. I think the dated graphics and the sound can absolutely be addressed with the more modern re-releases of the game, such as like Real Mist, which is what Cade played through. And so 
in that way, specifically, you might be able to say that it can hold up, but the gameplay is just, it is what it is. And that's not going to change no matter what you do with a re-release. And it's just bad. It just is. I don't think it was particularly great even when it was released and it has not aged well at all and has certainly not gotten better with time. I know, and as I've said this before, I know a lot of people have a fondness for this game and in some weird way, I kind of do too, because of that air of mystery that it has and it left that impression on us that's kind of stuck with us for, you know, many, many years. But revisiting it now really just exposes how like just infuriatingly inscrutable most of this game actually is like to a fault. And honestly, if you want to experience something like this, that's in a similar vein, but won't make you just completely tear your hair out. I do have a suggestion. There's plenty of really great candidates out there. But the one that really comes to mind for me, actually, that's very, very similar to this is a series of mystery puzzle games. It's called The Room. And I don't know if either of you are familiar with this at all. Silent Hill 4? Uh, yes, absolutely. That's Silent Hill 4, The Room. Please check it out. It's just like Myth. No, but it, it is a series of games. It's it's a little bit like uh, escape room games in that yes, way, but they are it good. is very much yeah. like Myth. And it's got really great production value. The puzzles are actually satisfying and by and large, very intuitive. So you might get stuck on something, but it's never because it's just like obtuse for the sake of being obtuse. Like it's always something that you can logically deduce and figure out without a huge amount of trouble. And it also still very much has the same like otherworldly ambiance that Mist kind of cultivated. So if you want this kind of experience, I might suggest going and checking out the series of games called The Room. I think you're going to have a, a better experience there. So, Cade, what do you think? I agree with your recommendation. Of the, I've only played the first one, and I played it on mobile, mm -hmm. which uh, was is actually a very cool casual experience. Yeah, it's good. As far as Mist holding up, uh, no, it doesn't hold up. I don't think you should play it. I don't think you should play the real Mist Masterpiece Edition. It's not worth $14, in my opinion, but it is worth your time is to watch some playthroughs, like some speed runs after diving down the Mist lore rabbit hole, because there's like five, six games. And uh, there's, yeah, three to four hours worth of content out there. And I was legitimately entertained, like sucked in and stayed up till three in the morning because I was like, OK, I'm going to watch the next one because I got to I got to find out. I got to <laughs> figure out how this all comes. Together. It's really, really, really good. It's one of those things that make you think you start thinking, dreaming in your mind. Ooh, this could be a really good Netflix or HBO series. This could be a series. This could be a good trilogy of movies. Um, you could redo it take the premise and completely change the gameplay. It's a really cool world. And if you're into world and lore, which a lot of gamers are, which is why we like a lot of series, it's good. But just watch it. It's You don't have to play the game to get all that. And I had a very legitimate good time watching YouTube videos about Mist Lore. All right. Well, there you have it. That is our, our recommendations. I believe we have come to the point of the episode where we're about ready to wrap up. We are ready. I think we put it took a pretty extensive dive into this one. Too extensive. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think we had some good discussion, though. But uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank Cade for for joining us on the show again. It is always a pleasure to have you here. So thank you. Thank you. Can I next time I come on? Can I can we pick a game? Um, I mean, technically, you picked this one. <laughs> know, so. I, you picked this game. If we're going to be pick one that's better because you gave me a list of games. Now I'm remembering. Yeah, the uh, Mist was the best ones. on the list. Yes, there's better ones, but I'm just joking. I'm I'll come on anytime you guys want. It's always a good time. Absolutely. We are we are also open to suggestions, by the way. I should yeah. feel like I should point that out. You can also plug in your your podcast again if you are so inclined. Yes, please do. Gaming Memories Podcast. I interview people like Chris and Shane, either who are into video games or into some other creative endeavor. And I tried to get to know them by asking about their favorite gaming memories growing up. It's a good way to talk to new people. And I'm doing my best to climb the ladder and find interesting people for you to be entertained. And that is the pitch. Fantastic. Well, as far as we are concerned, if you are listening to this show, then that means you have already found us. So congratulations. Hi, hello, welcome. We're glad that you're here. There are a few other ways that you can engage with the show if you would like to get more involved. 
Uh, we do have a public discord, which is uh, a really good time. We have a great little community going there. Um, a lot of great conversation and, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, we also do have our stream Sundays, which Chris will talk about in just a moment. And if you would like to support the show, um, in a slightly different fashion, we do have a Patreon as well as a merch store and all of these things can conveniently be found in one location. You just need to head over to linktree slash retro hangover. That's L I N K T R dot E E slash retro hangover and to choose the destination that suits you the best or click all of them. I don't care. I didn't make the internet. You can do what you want. It's a free country, depending on where you are. Probably. <laughs> but Chris, would you like to talk about the stream Sundays? It's a free country. And you can go to our stream Sundays of your own free volition every Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern time, where we will be playing a game of some sort. Mm. And you can go there and enjoy us playing games in this country of freedom. Enjoy your freedom and watch our streams. (laughs) Enjoy your freedom, citizen. That's all I have. Back to you. (laughs) (laughs) Fantastic. All right. Well, I suppose with all of that being said. Until next time, play with your I can't locate my fucking joysticks. (laughs) (laughs) Shane here with a quick message. You know, the one rule Chris and I have always gone by regarding advertisements is this. It has to be something we use and can personally vouch for. If you know me, you know I love coffee. And Bones Coffee Company has been my go-to for home brewing for quite some time now. Their small batch beans come in an impressive variety of flavors like Mint Invaders from Chocolate Space or Electric Unicorn, which I swear tastes exactly like Fruity Pebbles. And the best part? No added sugar or calories involved, just natural flavors infused right into the beans themselves. Build your own sample pack of five four ounce bags to find out which flavors speak to you, or jump in head first with full 12 ounce bags. They've even got K cups. Step up your homebrew game with Bones Coffee by visiting bit.ly slash RHP Bones. That's bit.ly slash RHP B O N E S.